Hey everybody, this is Tina again with Good Nurse, Bad Nurse, and this is a little bit of a special episode that I'm doing with you, the nurse, one of my favorite co-hosts. Hey, 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 hey. Always glad to be back, <laughs> Tina. Always, always and forever. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to have you every single time. We're going to do this at oh, least good. a couple times a month, let's just say. I like it. Yes. And so we're, this is the first time we are actually recording, doing a video recording of our Skype. We always Skype so we can kind of see each other and have a good conversation when we're, when we're recording the episode. And so this time we're going to start recording, doing a, the Skype conversation. So we're going to put that on the website behind the, uh, the Patreon wall so that if you um, sign up for the Patreon account, I think it's tier three, then you will, if you want to do that sort of thing, you can see the video of us following Fumbling our way through recording an episode because <laughs> it's going to be pretty raw. We don't, <laughs> it's not going to be edited. So, you know, it but, is what it so, is. So I have to say to you, so I'm like, you know, like I'm a YouTube Instagram guy. So the, so the camera yeah. is something I love. Like I, I, I that's my go-to. That's yeah. my thing. So I'm always down for the camera. But, but I think it's really exciting that the way you're doing it is the unedited version because I think it's, I don't want to say it's better, but it's exciting. It's like you get to see all of the, the build, like what, helps make the episodes you guys listen to on the podcast so i yeah. really like the idea you came up with <laughs> all right well thanks of i'm course. excited about it we'll see how it works so i guess we'll get into our story we have an in the news story that we do first just to kind of talk about something going on yes. in the world of nursing what do you I, what do you think about the story have you i mean everybody's talking in the medical field right now everybody's talking about vaccinated children and non-vaccinated children very 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 strong feelings about these <laughs> vaxxers versus anti-vaxxers mm -hmm. um and it, for me it's just like it's really scary the fact that people could just decide not to and like this mm -hmm. whole herd immunity thing and like it's just for me like I, f I really feel like it's going backwards i feel like vaxxing versus anti-vaxxing is in the same conversation as climate change versus non-climate change so i get mm -hmm. really like i know where i stand and like sometimes mm -hmm. i try to like i really want to be as understanding as possible but i'm like Pretty... It's science. Exactly. It's just, like, that's the science. way, like, I just, I have to be honest. That's where I come from. Mm -hmm. I come from the place where it's like, you need to be vaccinated. It's very important yeah. for your health, for your children's health, for the community's health. I think it's a, it's a must. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. So this story is based around the, that whole controversy, which I don't really know why it's a controversy, but it is. This story is vaccinated Seattle children's nurse diagnosed with measles. This is from nurse.org. And so this nurse who works at Seattle Children's Hospital, who is fully vaccinated, and not only is she fully vaccinated, but she also, when she would go into this uh, child's room who had the measles, she wore all of her PPE that she was supposed too. Good for her. Um, yeah, she, you know, she gowned up, she wore her mask, she wore her gloves, she did whatever she was supposed to do for her personal protective equipment. And she still was, she contracted the measles. This is it's insane. scary, horrifying to it me. It really is. Yeah, so they said that she followed all appropriate hospital policies and procedures when caring for the patient. And she said, it says that the patient had tested positive for the measles well, it doesn't really say what the circumstances were yeah. around that because it doesn't necessarily mean I, this article that I read, unless you saw something different, I didn't see that it necessarily was calling out the parents or uh, as being anti-vaxxers because there are no. situations where some children cannot be um, vaccinated. Yeah. yeah. And that, so it doesn't necessarily mean that this child, what, that it was the choice of the parents to not vaccinate them. Yeah. So I know you mentioned that she wore the PPE, but I, I'm just reading right here that they didn't I, well, they, so his symptoms came up the third day he was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So that's why. So they kind of, oh, it, yeah. they could have been a couple of days where he wasn't like they didn't know he had the measles, and then she went into the room then. But since they were since they diagnosed him, obviously that's when they put the iso placed him in isolation. But um, yeah. it's still it's still very 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 scary. Yes, it is. It's it's scary. Well, and the thing is, you don't know. I, you could have somebody who has the measles and, and they are contagious, but they aren't but showing symptoms right. at the time officially diagnosed. So yeah, people aren't being using the proper precautions. The patient visited the hospital's emergency department on June 22nd. 25th and 26th. And then once the patient showed symptoms on June the 26th, the child was placed in isolation. But it was there, like you said, on the 22nd and the 25th before. Yeah. And it says that the Centers for Disease Control suggests, um, highly recommends that anyone working in high risk environments like nurses should should actually get a measles booster. I guess you have to go get tested and they see 
if you have enough titers in your in your yeah. blood. So and I, then... I, I I don't know if this is like a state to state thing, but I know in Massachusetts we have to. So like you know how you have to do your employee health checkup prior to getting any job. So I know yeah. in, I, I, and I don't know how they redo it, especially if you because if you work in one hospital for like eight years, ten years, I don't know if they make you recheck. But I know in Massachusetts. And I've only been a nurse for three years, so I only know for the one hospital I went to that it is a must that you get these boosters. And I'm pretty sure you, mm-hmm. you need to have a measles booster here in Mass. So I don't know if this is a state-to-state thing, but if it's not, like the CDC says, it's a useful thing to get because you don't want to end up getting measles. Yeah. Well, if people are going to choose to allow their kids to be vulnerable to these diseases that were almost completely eradicated. Exactly. It's just sort of putting everybody at risk because the what was happening is there were so many people that were vaccinated that the very, very small number of children who can't be vaccinated for one reason or another were protected because everybody around them has been vaccinated. But if you have that many people who are not getting vaccinated, you're going to lose, you know, that that protection that you get. Exactly. So the, at the hospital, because we, we just had like a huge, like a, a mandatory education that you take. I um, mean, mm-hmm. so they call like that concept, just herd immunity. And we were right. given like a whole lecture and like presentation about it that like herd immunity only works when everyone who could get vaccinated does get vaccinated. If everyone yeah. who can get vaccinated, cho- like if some people who can get vaccinated chooses not to, the people who absolutely can't are at very, very high risk. And then Mm -hmm. it's spread. Yeah, that's exactly right. But also, also like, the thing I love about being a nurse is that it's required in most facilities, right? Like, it's Mm -hmm. absolutely required. It's like, even if you say no, you can't take the job unless you get vaccinated. And I don't know how you feel, but I feel like at least at the bare minimum, that should be a must for public schools. Like, that should be a must. Like, I I just feel that way. But I do, too. I I completely agree. Yeah completely agree it's too dangerous well and if if uh, if this nurse who was using these precautions was able to get the measles who had been vaccinated then children going to public school exactly. who have not been vaccinated can spread it to other children who still have been vaccinated yeah because you don't you don't walk around public schools with ppi on <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. They're not going around with their little N95 respirator mask right? on. <laughs> that would be insane. Getting fit tested every year. <laughs> I still, to this day, have I've worn one during um uh, with clinicals, like the one that wasn't fit tested for me. But to this day, I still have not been fit tested for N95. What? Yeah, they no. make us do this every year because we don't work on a unit that allows patients to come up. Oh, only if you work in the ED and then those specific units do you have to get fitted. I really, I just hate it so much. That whole thing, them putting that thing over your head, spraying the stuff. Oh, drives me crazy. And it takes what, 10, 15 minutes, but it's annoying. It really is. What are you going to do? Drive all the way over there on your day off or who has 10 or 15 minutes in their shift to just go off the floor? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It's not me. (laughs) I can tell you that. (laughs) <laughs> preach, preach, go, preach. So, I'm usually the one getting the email. Oh, no. Um, your fit test has expired. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and just like, I, my face is the same right? as it was last year. <laughs> There's nothing. It still fits. It still fits. But you got to do what you got to do. Right. So we are going to go on into the bad nurse story, which this week is not a doctor. Yes. This time, I really, really wanted to come up with something different, and I just was searching through, and I thought, respiratory therapist? Would there possibly be? And found this story about a respiratory therapist. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's jump on in. So this is the story of Ariette Barson, and I don't know if I am pronouncing any of these names correctly, but this is... Um, is a um, a lady who is from originally from Egypt, and she was living in California at the time. She went actually back to Egypt to meet Magdi Gurgis, and probably not pronouncing that correctly. But in, um, on February the sixth of nineteen eighty, she actually married him through an arranged marriage. Ooh, yes, yeah, that's different. And then, 
it's very different. I mean, it's a cultural thing. And, I, and I've heard people talk about this who are in that culture. And what they have said to me is, you know, it, it may seem really foreign and bizarre to someone who is not of that culture and doesn't understand it. But think about how many divorces, you know, happen in other cultures who don't yes. have arranged marriages. So they have a very low divorce rate. Um, that, that's what that's what this person was saying. And that also because your family knows you so well. Yeah. And they will pick they may they may actually choose better for you <laughs> than you would choose for yourself. Tina, I was with you up until that last part. I don't know if yeah. anyone could pick something better for me than myself. But um, <laughs> but everything else is not. You're right, though. You're, you're absolutely right. Because, I, I mean, I, and maybe it is the culture of those other um, countries where, like, if mm-hmm. you are in arranged marriage, getting a divorce is, like, looked down upon. But at the same time, if you just look at the bare bones numbers, um, mm-hmm. especially in places where they are arranged marriages compared to places where they aren't, the places where they are arranged marriages, the divorce rate is is definitely much less. Yes, exactly. So this couple, Magdi and Ariette, I'm going to just pronounce it that way and apologize if yep. it's not correct. They lived in California. They returned back to California after they were married in Egypt. And they had two sons, Richard and Ryan. Very American, non-Egyptian. <laughs> Those two names are very different than Magdi and Ariat. I know. I thought the same thing. Yeah. So in California, Magdi Gurgis um, became a, a licensed respiratory therapist where he worked very long hours. Respiratory therapists are a lot like nurses. They work usually kind of the same t- sort of shifts, you know, seven to seven, um, three days a week. Sometimes work picking up a lot of overtime. Yep. And so probably I would imagine he probably did because the opportunities to work over and make the extra money um, is tempting. There. Yeah. And it's always yeah. there. And if you need it, you, mm-hmm. you have it. Yes. And respiratory therapists, I think, are probably also a lot like nurses in that there is always a shortage of them. Mm-hmm. You can say that again. <laughs> yeah. So on the night of September 29th of M in 2004, Richard, one of the boys, left the home around nine o'clock and his mom, Ariet, went to sleep. And then Ryan, the other son, was out with some friends and he didn't get home until after one o'clock in the morning, which was technically September 30th. Mm hmm. And then he, he got home. He came in through the back door. It was like a sliding glass door. He locked the door and then went on into his bedroom and then put his earbuds in and started listening to music and fell asleep. So at some point after he fell asleep, he heard his bedroom door open and it kind of, I guess, flung open and smacked against the, you know, the stopper, you know, thing that's up on, on the wall, keeping it from banging the keeping, wall. Yeah. So I guess that that's sort of what I envisioned is someone just like slammed the the door open Mm -hmm. and he felt a hand covering his mouth, a body on top of him. So he was literally being attacked in his sleep. And he says he bit that person's hand, um, rolled off the bed and just they just a scuffle ensued. They were knocking over the lamp. He fell into the dresser. It was just a huge fight. And he started yelling for his mom and for Richard. He didn't realize, I guess, that Richard wasn't there. Maybe he wasn't even thinking, of course. You know, he just woke up and and all this is going on. He tried to swing at the person. The intruder was telling him to be quiet or he would hurt him. Then another person came in, a second male dressed in dark clothes, came in And the story says that neither of these people who were attacking him made any demands of him. They just said, you know, just told him to stop resisting. They tied his hands behind his back and put duct tape around his head. And they had used initially duct tape around his hands. And then when he was being, they were kind of shoving him into a closet, the duct tape came loose from his hands, from his wrists. And so the the intruder that was attacking him took his gloves off and grabbed a shoelace and tied his hands together with a shoelace. I was just going to yeah. say, like, this is like like nightmares of nightmares, right? Yeah. Like, you, you're at your house, yeah. you, you think you're safe, like, everything's normal. 
and you wake up to two grown men that you've never seen in your life. They're in dark clothes. You can't even tell who they are. And they have their mouth over you. I mean, this is just a, a, like a scary start to a very scary story. It's horrifying. It really is. Ryan says that he heard his mother. I guess she came out of her bathroom or her, her bedroom. She came out of the master bedroom. And he heard her say, take anything you want. He said she sounded really scared. And then the second man who attacked him bear hugged her and moved her back toward her room. And then he could hear her scream while she was being carried away. And that's when the the other man forced him into the closet. And he said he kept pleading with him to not kill him. And sort of weird, but he says that the guy said, I know your circumstances. I know what you're going through. I'm not going to kill you. It's just really odd, I thought. Very odd. Very, mm-hmm. very odd. And that's when he duct taped his feet. And when he saw his hands not being held together, I guess, good enough with the duct tape, he used the shoestrings to tie his hands. And then he left. And then he says while he was in the closet, he was scared to death, of course, but he heard a car engine start and then he could hear a muffler. So he thought they were leaving, but he wasn't 100 percent sure. So he ran out of the closet. He grabbed his cell phone, ran out of the house. He saw his mother's bedroom door closed, but he was afraid to go inside because he wasn't 100 percent sure that both of them had left. And he was just afraid. So, and he was young. I don't remember how old he was, but I, for some reason, I'm thinking he was maybe even still a teenager. Yeah, no, I was was feeling the same thing. I was feeling teenage years. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So I could totally understand him being just so scared, you know. So he ran to a friend's house and he called his brother. He called his dad. I mean, he called 911, of course, but, and then... He, it's a, he, his dad answered the phone right away and he told him what happened. He asked if Ryan, you know, if he was okay. And then his mother was found when the police got there. Of course, she was, she was dead. She was lying on the right side of the bed in the master bedroom, nearly decapitated. <sighs> Yeah, that's when things went from like zero to, I mean, not zero, but this was like, it took a turn for, oh my yeah. God, like this is crazy. Yeah, I, it seems, you know, the all of the stories that we, we do, the experts always tell us that overkill means it was someone exactly. that you know, but this is, the son saw the person. So if they knew, if he knew him, you would think, that it would he be would've... a close and shut case, right? Like, this is right. the person who did it. Yeah. And he, he saw his face. Exactly. So, because he was able to give a, a kind of a, one of those composite sketches of what he looked like. Yeah. So, another odd thing is there, was, there were no signs of forced entry into the house. There was a hide-a-key on the side of the house. Not bothered. They didn't take anything from inside the house. I guess there was cash lying around. There was jewelry. They, they didn't need, it didn't even look like they ran through the house looking for, you know, opening drawers and like as if they were looking for something to take. They found 5.21 grams of marijuana, plastic baggies and a, and a bong stem in his closet. So and it says that he told them where it was. So I guess he was like, look, I... I have um, some drugs he, in the room. Yeah, just so just so you know, I do have this. Yeah. So they did, like you said, they lived in a two-story house in a gated community. You had to go through the gate. You had to either have a clicker, I guess, a kind of almost like a garage remote is what I was envisioning. Yep. Or a code or some resident with you to get in. So... It seems really odd that these two people who he didn't recognize were able to get in and that didn't there didn't seem to be any sign of of how they would have been able to do that. And then he started getting these instant messages 
So uh, AOL, I don't is AOL still a thing? <laughs> it's definitely not a thing. But when I was reading this, I was like, this took me <laughs> back a few years. <laughs> AOL. <laughs> this took me back. <laughs> that AIM message. I like it. I know. So um, he started getting these AOL instant messages. He actually got them before this even happened. He mm-hmm. got some kind of cryptic, weird, almost threatening kind of messages that said things like, better watch your back. I know where you live. You're going to pay for this. And he wasn't really sure what where this person was coming from this. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense to him. And then after the murder, he got a message that said, how did you like your gift? LOL. Um, that's just horrible. Uh, in January 2010, that's a long time after yes. this happened. Yes, it is. This uh, detective by the name of James Wilson got permission to work on the case. And watching the the video of him, like a, an, the interview, he said that it occurred to him in Ryan's story that he said that one of the intruders took off his glove and tied to tie the shoe. If you can imagine trying to tie a shoe with gloves on, it's Impossible. not easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. And especially to get it really tight, like, of course, he would be wanting to make sure it was tight enough. So he thought, wonder if there's any way there would be DNA on the shoestring. And this was a long time after. Exactly. Like a very long time. 2004, 2010. That's a long time to keep a shoelace. And to, and for there to still be DNA on it. Right. Yeah. But I. I would feel like it would be a long shot, but when they submitted the evidence for additional, for, you know, more testing, they actually got a hit on the shoelaces that were used to tie him up. And the man's name was Andrew Bridget or Bridget, Bridget, I guess. He was a known gang member and he was actually in prison at the time that they found his DNA was a match for that he was in prison for manslaughter but at the time Ariette was killed he was not in custody he was out yeah and also the composite sketch that was done by ryan at the beginning when that he sort of you know described what the person looked like did match. match the description. Yes. Obviously, this is a really sad story, but like, yeah. well, just like last week, the, the 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 story we did last week, I just get happy when at least. So we know because we know that there were two people, but this is at least one person that was mm-hmm. caught, and I always feel like at least with the closure, at least understanding that the person who did commit this crime is in prison, and we know it for a fact. That always makes me feel a little happy. I know there's some twists and turns to happen moving forward in the story, but just alone with this person, like I'm very happy that this happened. Happened. And good for this new detective that picked that up because that, like you said, is a crazy long shot. But it turned out it turned out like being the answer to the question. Like it turned out I finding know. the actual killer. So that's super, super I know. good. Yeah. And they did when it first happened. Did you watch the, the video where it showed all, all the 911? Yeah. Yep. I don't know how you felt about it. But when I first started watching that, I kind of understand why. But the police initially did suspect that Ryan what had something to do with this and maybe even Richard, they interviewed both of them separately yep. and really were pretty hard on them. They grilled them for a long time. And this is right after their mother had been murdered and right after Ryan had also been attacked, but they felt like he was just acting really strangely. You know, they, they, they felt like, well, that's odd. You ran out of the house and didn't even open the door to your mother's bedroom to check on her. Even the 911 operator that he, when he called, said, why would you not have gone back to check on your mother? Like, she totally called him out about that. And I I, I wonder if that wasn't somehow the 911 operator kind of insinuating, like, hmm, I wonder if you didn't have something to do with this, you know? Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't know if you were going to bring this up, because I do have some very mixed thoughts on this, right? Like, mm-hmm. from his perspective... From the kid's perspective, you just got mm-hmm. tied up. You heard your mom yelling and screaming. You mm-hmm. you know that there's these two grown men. And yeah. the one one of the guys literally said, I know what your situation is. I'm not going to kill you. Right? So in his head, these guys are capable of murder. They tied him up. 
it was his opportunity to escape. So the first thing he did is grab his cell phone and run outside. And the only reason I wouldn't su- suspect him is because the first thing he did was call 911. Yeah. And it's just a super stressful situation. I hate to be the person to say, why didn't you go to your mom's room, go check on her, grab her, try to save her? Because that is like some superhero TV movie stuff. Like in the real situation, someone who threatens to kill your life and ties you in the closet in the middle of the night, that's not someone that you want to go ahead and fight. Like, it's just, I felt really badly for him. And on top mm-hmm. of the entire situation, when they brought him to the police station and they were yeah. interviewing them separately and they wouldn't tell him about their mother. Like, I was like, this is super intense. I don't know. I, I just, I felt very torn about the situation. Very, very torn about the situation. I did too. I I kind of thought it was odd at first. And then Richard in the in the interview I thought he acted a little overly dramatic when he found out that his mother had died. Yeah, agreed. So Um, that I agree with you. I mean, and the thing is, it's not fair. I agree. And I think it's not fair to to even consider the way someone acts when they're grieving because people are so different. Mm -hmm. People are just so different. So I just don't think it's, it's really fair. I think we have to learn how to try to turn that tendency off yeah you know because we don't know how we would act but but that the fact is that initially they did suspect ryan they did possibly consider richard but they did rule them out and then they turned their focus on the husband magdi gurgis and they started realizing that their their relationship and their marriage was definitely not one that was it was not good it yeah, did not to, say have the, a, to say the least, Tina, to say the it least. Was, it was bad. Yeah. From the very beginning, even mm-hmm. from the very beginning, when they first came back from Egypt, by all accounts, they were not affectionate toward each other. She would try to be affectionate to him, but he wasn't affectionate. So it probably just didn't, you know, if it's not going to go both ways, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. He would, whenever they would have a fight and that, you know, sometimes whenever people talk about marital fights, what they're really saying is abuse. What they're really saying is a fight is sometimes you're yelling at each other and you're both arguing and it's equal. And sometimes a fight is one person is literally beating up the other and take in con- trying to control the other person. And yeah. that's abusive. Yes. And that's what this situation was. He was abusing her. And so apparently after they would get into these fights and he probably overreacted and was abusive toward her. Then maybe after a little bit after that, he would be affectionate to her. But other than that, he hardly ever showed any ref- remorse. Affection. Uh, yeah. None of it. Yeah. Um, and cause you're right. I like the way you explain that because when people say, yeah, I got into a fight with my boyfriend. I got into a fight with my husband. Mm-hmm. Like you said, in your head, and like in everyone's head, when you're not thinking about this is like a crazy murder case, you think, oh, mm-hmm. they were arguing. But just like you said, in a lot of situations, when people say fight, it literally means just one person in that relationship is just towering over the other, telling them what to do, yelling, screaming, and at times physically harming the other person. Yes. So that is abuse, like full stop, period. Like, let's not have a conversation about it. Absolutely. So toward the end of the marriage, they were sleeping in separate bedrooms, which, of course, that happens, you know, with married couples. Sometimes they they get to a point where it's it's too hard to completely separate, maybe for financial reasons. Who knows what the maybe for the children or whatever. They just don't want to completely move into separate homes, but they just kind of separate and move into separate bedrooms. Mm -hmm. They were doing that. And the boys, Richard and and Ryan said that he was very strict, very controlling. He was always concerned about money. He didn't give her any power whatsoever over any of their money. She didn't balance her checkbook. She didn't have money to spend. He was the one that chose how all of the money was spent. She didn't they said it was a traditional, I guess, r- marriage from their culture, what they were used to. Not Ryan and Richard, but from what Ariette and Magdi were used to from their culture from Egypt. And that is that the man has control over the finances and the woman is not in any way, doesn't make any kind of decisions like that or 
doesn't have anything to do or any control over the money. Yep. yep. Ryan said that he played sports, but his dad would never come to any of his games. They didn't have a um, a close relationship. He said he worked a lot and he was just very a very negative person. And they just weren't close. He was not close to his children. That was their perspective. That's how they saw it. Ariette, um, the their mother, worked in a factory. She was the one that really took care of her sons. Mm-hmm. It says she was a Coptic Orthodox Catholic. I don't know that means. <laughs> I don't. Me neither. I I don't know. I've never heard of that before. So she took her sons to church on Sundays. So I'm assuming that somehow goes along with being a Coptic Orthodox Catholic. I don't. I just don't understand. I don't know. I I didn't. I've never even heard of it but... until reading this story. Me either. Yeah. Maybe it just means a real strict, like tries to stick strictly to the. I know Orthodox didn't, doesn't that sort of mean yeah, like, traditional, like exactly very truly old school. Yeah. Right. So I don't. Know. I don't know. I didn't really look that up, but um, they always went to church. And Richard described her as being very sweet mm-hmm. and always looking out for her sons, putting them first. And then they described their father as being someone who had a very explosive and violent temper, very harsh, angry. Richard said that when he was 10, he got a potato chip stain on his homework and Gurgis picked him up off the ground and tried to choke him over that. And... At some point, he's uh, Ryan came home when he was 16, came home late, and he yanked a, his silver chain off his neck and kicked him on the floor until Richard pulled him off of him. So just kind of, you know, you can imagine just someone, a father who was probably very distant, not yes. connected, worked a lot. But when he was there, they were afraid of him. He was violent. You didn't know when he was going to go off. You didn't know what was going to set him off. If you make any mistake whatsoever, he would just use that as an opportunity to bully and take out all of his stress and frustration on them. That's yeah. kind of my that's like my a very, perception. very angry man with a very short temper. Yeah. Not someone you want to be around. And I mm-hmm. Just like horrible father figure, just a bad husband, bad, just not a good guy, not a good no, guy. Not at all. They said one uh, one time it, it was so bad, they were so afraid of him that the entire family, I guess both boys and the mom, slept in the bedroom uh, in the bedroom on the floor and barricaded the door. They were so afraid of that he was going to, I guess, come in and hurt them. That is, it's just, like, it's so scary to think that, like, insane. you live with a person that you have to barricade yourself from. Your I, father. Yeah. Right? And I, I just, I, I was looking because I wanted to know what co-workers felt of him. Because I didn't see much of anything outside of this. Just because yeah. I wanted to know what other people outside of the family thought of him. I know that the wife had a friend, and maybe you'll get there in a little bit. But outside of, like, that core group of just the family and the wife's friend... They didn't have much from coworkers, patients, anyone else. Yeah, it's almost seemed like they maybe stayed to themselves a lot, especially him. He, he seemed like he just worked all the time. Yeah, it didn't seem like um, he was the conversational type at work. <laughs> right, right, probably not. <sighs> yeah. On February the 3rd of 2004, um, and this was not long before... The incident. Um, yeah, this happened. She was punched in the face by her husband and her nose was bloodied. Her eye was swollen and her, her son Richard took her to the hospital. Now Richard just incidentally went to nursing school. So he's some sort of nurse. I never saw what kind of nurse, but he's a, he's nurse. a nurse. Yeah. Yeah. Go Richard. Good for you, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He took her to the hospital to get treatment. And while she was there, she explained to an officer what happened the police arrested him, her husband, you know, Gurgis, and he moved out of the family house. Then the next day, a detective interviewed her in her house and placed a protective order that would prohibit him from contacting her and going anywhere near their residence. And then he interviewed her again on the, that detective interviewed her again on February 17th. And she gave a few more details about what happened. She basically asked him for money 
for their sons and when he wouldn't give her any money. And so she kind of, so it's kind of like she was asking for money. He said no. And then she starts kind of pushing a little bit and she starts comparing him to his brother saying, mm-hmm. well, your brother, you know, he takes care of his, his family, yeah. his wife, he gives her money, that sort of thing. And he didn't appreciate that whatsoever. And so he got so mad that he hit her with a closed fist. I just wanted to just make sure that everybody listening understands like the situation so Mm -hmm. yeah so she was asking for money right but in the videos um they explained it in a little more detail that she wanted because it was their anniversary and it's not Mm -hmm. like she was saying give me money so i can go do my own thing she wanted to go to dinner with him and when she says that she wanted money for the kids she was saying that she wanted money to help him out with college so it's not like she was saying, give me money. I want to go buy a purse. I want new shoes. She was literally saying, can we have money so we, you and me as husband and wife, go out to dinner so our kids can go to college? So, like, I, I know no one listening to this podcast thinks that, oh, she was like, e- even if she was asking for money for those reasons, no one's thinking that he's a good guy. But, yeah. like, the reason she was asking for money just makes it even so much more worse that he would punch her for asking for money for those reasons. He's literally like, like to the core of this person, he's just a bad man. Yes, absolutely. And she, she basically said, you know, he, he's in love with money. That's all he cares about is money. So she was very afraid of him after he was arrested. And she actually told Ryan that she was worried about what he would do, what they would do if he did kill her. So she was worried about her boys. What would happen to them? You know, what are you, what are you guys going to do if, if your dad kills me kind of thing? That's so scary. That's like the craziest conversation in all of the world. Like, how do you have a conversation like that? Oh, yeah. She talked about getting a divorce, moving to Northern California. She had some other family that lived there. So she talked about doing that. And then he becomes concerned. So he gets arrested for domestic violence. And that's a serious offense. If that actually goes to trial or he somehow is convicted of what he was accused of doing, he could lose his license to be a respiratory therapist. So he goes and tries to patch things up with his wife, also goes to his son, Richard. Richard sort of reminds me, he's older, he's the oldest, and he sort of reminds me as the one that sort of the the responsible one. You know, he kind of is the one taking care of everything. He goes to his son and, and says, hey, convince your mom to go back on what she said, you know, because she told the police all that stuff that happened. He talked Richard into talking his mother into saying, oh, he didn't really do that. I, I said that, but I was just mad and basically recanting what she said before about him hitting her. So he did, uh, they offered for him to serve a year in jail. He rejected that. And he, he was so upset about it that he started making comments to people like his sons, his brother saying things, you know, basically like, I'd be better off if she was, if she was dead, it would be better for me to kill her. Because if she was dead, she couldn't testify. Yep. The case would go away. He even mentioned killing the district attorney. The, this dude yeah, is he, unhinged. He's unhinged. Yes, for sure. For oh sure. my God. Yes. He talked to his brother that way. He talked to his son saying all of these things. I don't know what in the world people think are thinking. You know, you're, right. you think all this stuff is not going to come out when you actually go through with your plans. His brother was so worried about it, about some of the, th- the way he was talking, that he sent a couple of anonymous letters to the police and just letting them know anonymously, I'm worried about Ariat's safety. And I'm worried about the safety of the the deputy district attorney because of some things that were said. And then the detective that was working on the case, Detective Williams, tried to get Ariat relocated. And that's so sad to me because he obviously saw that this was a concern and he was trying to help her and she refused. And it's so sad. I think people in this situation, you know, she told her children that she was worried about it. But I guess in reality, she didn't really think it was going to happen or else she would have taken them up on the relocation. It sucks, man. It really sucks. Like You can't blame her for thinking he, like the cops are involved. He's not going to do anything bad. But at the same time, this dude is wild. This dude is crazy. 
I know. He really is. He's out of control. And you can see it. Like you said, in hindsight, it's real. It's obvious. Yeah. It it would have probably been obvious from anyone from looking from the outside looking in from yep. her perspective. It was probably so much of it was probably every day that she dealt with that it was hard for her to see that it was that, dangerous. That she was in a very dangerous situation. Good for the, de- the, the police officers, the detective for at least giving her that option, at least giving her that option. Yes, he he was so upset um, at the thought that he might, that she might get half of what he worked for, that he was even talking about cutting it back on his work hours. So, and then having Ryan live, it's like, let's work out a way that I don't have to pay her any child support. If I take one of the children and you live with me and then, and then I work less hours, then I wouldn't have to pay and that's all he was that's all he cared about and then they had a preliminary hearing about his arrest for the domestic uh, violence incident and she testified about him hitting her and she also said you know how she recanted the the statements about her about her the abuse abu- uh, being abused so in what when she testified at this preliminary hearing she said that the reason that she recanted and signed those statements recanting the allegations was because she was afraid of him and then he threatened to cut off the utilities, not pay the mortgage, and empty out their bank accounts. He filed a petition for divorce and then she planned to move to Northern California after Ryan finished high school. So now that they know who one of, so there were two people, they but they know one of them. They also realize that what is the what would be the his motive? This person, this random gang member, what would be his motive for breaking into this family's home, keeping one person alive, and uh, you know, keeping the the son alive and killing the wife? It just seemed very odd. Yes, yeah, so just like, to rem- just to remind the people listening, so mm-hmm. the murder happened in two thousand and four, and in right. two thousand and ten is when they figured it figured out that. Um, who it was. Um, mm-hmm. So this is like post 2010, them trying to figure out why would a random gang member who is currently in jail, why would he want to kill a random mother? And just the whole situation, like we described earlier, it was super mm-hmm. violent, which we know seems very personal, right? And there was no money missing. There was nothing missing from the house. Yes. So they actually set up a an undercover operation. And they posed as gang members. And then these gang members, these police officers who are posing as gang members, approach Gurgis and they they go up to him and they have this all in recording. And they say, you know, I'm going to need more money to, to be quiet because, the, you know, they're putting pressure on us for for this murder. So these two police officers, Victor Thrash and Jerry Carter, when they approach him in this recorded conversation, this is kind of how this goes. So Magdi says, what do you need? And then the one of the officers, of course, he thinks they're, he's a gang member. But one of the officers says, um, you know, check it out, man. My homie is locked up in the pen right now. <laughs> so he's talking, you know, in this, in the, this police officer I saw interview with him. And he said, I know how these people talk. He said, I don't talk like this normally, but I know this culture. You know, it's so he knows how to like pull this off. Even he said, I've never been a gang member, but I know how to pull it off, I guess. Yeah. So it's pr- kind of an award winning actor, this guy, this, because this was pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. He really did. He was. You guys should definitely get, just let. I mean, I don't know. Like I always say this. Like you guys should look stuff up. But like, if you want to know, this dude sounded so legit. He yes. sounded so legit. If you watch the uh, the series on YouTube. Hmm. Yes, he really did. He anybody would have would have thought he was oh, yeah, for real. Man. Nobody would think a police officer could be that good of an actor. So then Magdi says, "What are you talking about?" And he says, "You know." Basically, he's asking for five thousand dollars, and he said, "He said if you give me five thousand dollars, we we won't go to the police." And then, so Magdi has a girlfriend, Jacqueline Hussein is her name. She pulls up to the house about the time they're having this conversation, and sees him hand 
sees uh, the police officer hand Gurgis a piece of paper and tell him to call me by 10 o'clock to morning. So the police officer hands him a piece of paper with, with a phone number on there and says, call me by 10 o'clock tomorrow. And Hussein, the, his girlfriend, Gurgis's girlfriend gets nervous because she's worried because Gurgis tells her that they threatened him. And she said he seemed scared. So she called Ryan, his son, without his knowledge, of course, mm-hmm. and was, you know, basically like, I'm, I'm worried about him. This happened, told him exactly what happened. He told her, call the police and let them know. Of course, they are the police, but, <laughs> exactly. you know, uh, the next day, Gurgis called the number that was left by that police officer who he thought was a gang member. He called from a payphone in Long Beach, and basically he they he negotiated terms with an undercover police officer. So Gurgis says, "What's the problem, my friend?" And the officer says, "Well, um, my boy is locked down in the pen," and he says. We're just trying to get paid to keep it hush. So basically he's saying, I need you to give me some money so I can get out of town or my boy can get out of town. So um, I hear you. I hear you, girl. <laughs> so Gurgis is saying this is what really pretty much locked the bolt, the the yeah. gate on him. Yeah. This sealed the deal. He said, I thought you got you got paid everything. Oh, signed, sealed, delivered. Oh, done yeah. and done. I mean, he's talking to a gang member who he thinks is a gang member who is asking him for more money to continue to be quiet about a murder. And and they all everybody knows he's talking about his wife. Yeah. And then he says, I thought you got paid. You got paid everything. I mean, you, I mean, to me, that's like that seals it right there. They could have arrested him right there, but they let it keep going. He said, we've got paid everything, but, you know, he's like, basically he's saying they're putting so much pressure on me that we, I need money. I need more money. I need, you know, $5,000. You can, you can afford this. Gurgis has the money. We find out later that he has like $10,000 cash in his house. So he has the money (laughs) and he's still negotiating. He doesn't want to give $5,000. He is going, I mean, if this were true and this guy really was a gang member, is five thousand dollars that much to spend to to, to get them... a gang member off of your back? Like this yeah. dude is wild, Tita. This dude Amazing. is obsessed with his money. Yeah, and he says, "Well, I only have fifteen hundred dollars." So they negotiate that and arrange to. All right, fine, we'll take the fifteen hundred dollars. But it's so weird. Gur just asks him about a middleman, and I'm like, I didn't really understand that whole conversation. He says. Who's the middleman? And then the officer is kind of like thrown for a little bit of a loop. Like, "Mm, what? He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, there was another guy that was. Exactly. So the officer, though, he played it very, very cool. He just kind of talked his way all the way through that and said a whole lot of nothing. But he let it go. Or just kind of let it go. But he was more concerned with how am I supposed to trust This person, when I meet him to give him the $1,500, I guess, is what he's saying. Yeah. Um, So, but they worked it out. And they met the next day at 1 o'clock at the Home Depot. (laughs) So many (laughs) things happen at the Home Depot, it seems like. (laughs) It really does. You get good supplies there, especially (laughs) if you try to do all these crazy things. I mean, how many people, how many times have you seen a murderer on video at the Home Depot standing in line? (laughs) It's never a Lowe's. Why is it always a Home Depot? <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> so you can, they do have this on video. Uh, Gurgis, Gurgis hands the officer a white envelope with 15 $100 bills. The officer tries to get him to talk more about why he had his wife killed. He just, you know, milking it for all he, I guess, can, can get. Well, the, if he can get a confession... Point. Right? Yeah, my, why not? I mean, he's got him at this point, and he knows yeah. that he might as well just keep on trying to get more out of him. But he didn't really bite because, nope. you know, he basically he's like, you know, why, um, why did you have your wife killed? Why, what, what did she do that deserved it? But he wouldn't bite. He was just like, um, um, wouldn't say anything. And they arrested him, 
um, he called his girlfriend, Hussein, he called her, and he um, kind of explained to her what he had done, trying to explain why he would have done that. And he said he told her that the two men approached him a few days before threatening to hurt him and his children if he didn't pay him five thousand dollars in twenty four hours. Uh, so he sort of re reworded the the situation le- leaving out a few details. yeah, and then um he claimed that he was he wrote down all the serial numbers for all of the one hundred dollar bills and that he was going to contact the police about it that somehow this was i guess um i mean what else is he going to say but that that was what that was his answer to why he did that was because um he was afraid of them he was going to give them the money write down the serial numbers and then go to the police and say um here are the serial numbers these people approached me asking me for money and i felt like i had to give them the money but what he didn't know at the time i guess is that it was on video and all of the conversation was on video so exactly that doesn't go along at all with the conversation Sorry, that they really but, uh, had. We right. know the truth. Yeah, because the that conversation tells the whole story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when he says you've already been paid everything, that just tells you right there he already gave them money. Why would exactly. he've already given the money? Yeah. So their defense was pretty much that Ryan Ryan did sell sell marijuana. He was kind of involved in drug dealing on a pretty probably low key level but that was their defense was that this happened because of the people that he was associated with because of the the drug dealing that he did he did say that you know there were some threats that were going on you know the aol (laughs) um, yeah messages he there was a, a person that had been shot in long beach Ooh. that had something to do with the whole drug dealing that Ryan was doing. And it was a place that Ryan did go to regularly. So they just, basically his defense was to try to tie all that in together and say that this, that the killing of his mother was tied to, to yes. his personal life and him being involved with the drug dealers. The drugs. and Yeah. Um, but it just didn't fly because nope. way too much evidence showing that the husband obviously was involved in most of what, what was going on. So yeah. a jury did find him guilty in April of 2014 of murder and conspiring to kill his wife for financial gain. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And Richard and Ryan spoke during his sentencing and they described how they lived in fear of his fa- of their father all of their childhood he says he maintained his innocence throughout the whole thing and still does to this day. And he said to the judge, you're about to sentence an innocent man. He said, God is my witness. I had nothing to do with the killing of my wife. He urged the judge to find the his wife's real killers. And his sons asked the judge to give their father the maximum penalty. Mm. And he was convicted of hiring the men who killed his wife and of course, you know, she was nearly decapitated. It, I don't know what story he must have told to the man or men that, that did the, the actual killing. But for them to be so violent, it almost seems like he must have sold some sort of story to them that I, they felt like, you know, I don't know. But at the same time, um, well, I remember in the, the video uh they were saying that the guy that was in jail that was already in jail that mm-hmm. he was what what do you call when you're a hired killer like they said that he like he did that like that that's something that he he was, was a hitman it was a hitman that's that's the one yeah that he was a hitman but mm-hmm. i don't know like i feel like if you're a hitman you want to go in and you just want to kill him and not yeah. make things intense but to almost decapitate someone i mean yeah. that is some real intense stuff so I'm like, really, really, like, you have to, like, either enjoy the process of killing people or you have to be super, super pissed off at the lady. You know, the only thing I can think of is we did a, a story um, when I, when we first started the podcast about a nurse who, this is actually a good nurse story, but it was a fascinating story. She came home 
after working at the ER one day and there was a man waiting for her. And as it turned out, her ex-husband had hired a hitman to kill her. And so he was lying in wait in her house, attacked her. She fought back and basically used her training and knowledge that they give us, you know, in the hospital of how to fight off someone. And she ended up getting away from him and she, she, she killed him. (laughs) Um, And then got out and went next door. But, and she, she called 911 and she said, I've been attacked. Someone broke into my house and they said, are you hurt? You know, do you, do you need us to send someone to help you? And she said, you need to send someone to help him. Yes. Do you think so, girl? But what is her. interesting, I <laughs> know what they found in that guy, that guy had brought a backpack and he had like, I want to say he had like cocaine, cocaine in there. He had Hershey bars and stuff. Sam and I just laughed our heads <laughs> off about that. Like this guy, but, um, what was his night? What was he planning to do that night? <laughs> cocaine, cocaine and Hershey, Hershey bars. Hershey bars? <laughs> That's but, an interesting night. What I'm wondering, you know, did this guy that killed Aria, did she, did he maybe do something like cocaine or something to just get himself? Oh, yeah. I hear you. you. Know, oh, yeah. Pumped he up. was drugged up prior to. Right. Yes. yes. To be able to, to go through with it. That's, that's a really, yeah. I can, I, I, think can, I can see that. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe sometimes these, that's what these guys do. These people that do these killings, it's, that's more or less a business transaction. Um, and that's. Yeah they're getting paid to do it but i guess they have to kind of do something to give themselves the cur- courage to do it maybe because he was no normal human being wants to kill or is able right. to kill just someone just for no reason mm-hmm. like yeah so like drugs does seem like a really good maybe yeah. if he was on drugs and you just that would be the answer to the overkill i don't know exactly exactly so the son the son spoke at the sentencing and ryan talked about how he had been bound up and tied, put in the closet, how he can still hear his mother's last words in his head. And Richard basically begged his father to tell the truth. He told him he forgave him for all that he had done to him and Ryan. He asked him to confess and to repent. And they talked about how they lived in fear for that their father would have killed them as well. And they still, Richard says, said that he sleeps with a gun under his pillow. He has an alarm. He has dogs, cameras, everything. He's just so afraid and paranoid after all of this. And they, um, the prosecutor called Gurgis, the Gurgis home, a house of abuse. And they say that Ariet was a, um, a victim of domestic violence, which of course, of course she was. Um, and ba- and they, they say, you know, at months after she finally got the courage to leave her husband, you know, look what happened. She finally gets the courage to leave him. And then this is what he decides to do. Yeah. Just a couple of things on that. So the, the sons being afraid for their lives, mm-hmm. like that is super scary because at least when you know when the murderer is in jail, like, oh, my goodness, the murderer is in jail. Like this sucks. But I like. You know, I can grieve now. Like, I can finally properly grieve. Right. But, yeah, the one who paid for the murder to happen is in jail. But who is to say that his the dad is not crazy enough to try to finagle a way to get um, someone from the outside to go and attack his sons? Because his yeah. sons wanted the full. So, like, I can definitely understand, like, the just the, the, like the lifetime of fear not knowing. It's just so scary to know that your dad's in prison. Your dad like hired someone to kill your mother, and he knows that you wanted the full penalty for your for him to go to prison, right? Yep. Um, and then the other part is, just like you said, that last thing you said about even after coming forward with the domestic abuse, mm-hmm. the worst kind of violence happened to her. She ended up getting killed um, at the end, even after. So it's just it's just it's just very important to say it and let people know because. Domestic violence, you know, uh, abuse like this, is sexual assault, all of these things, it's not as cut and dry as why didn't you come forward? Or why didn't this happen? There are many different situations. And a lot of the times, even after the first and the second and the third, yeah. bad things happen and things can't escalate. So it's a really sad story. It just is. It's horrible. It's really horrible what happened to these these boys and what happened to Ariette, their mother. The whole he, um, yeah. 
they they said he broke down and said he was a good father and how much he loved his children but i think we all know the reality is he was very self-centered and didn't really probably doesn't know how to love anyone Anthony Bridget, the hitman, was found guilty of murder in April 2018 and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Thank goodness. So he's at least off the streets for good. Good. One less person willing to to do something like this for someone else. Yeah. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. That, that guy. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, the ups and downs. I mean, these stories, they get really intense, Tina. These stories mm-hmm. get very, very intense. I know. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> makes you want to shake it all off because he's, yeah. I know. Well, there is, that's kind of the point for the, the bad nurse story or the, you know, the, I mean, the good nurse story. So we do like to end it on a good note so that we don't stay <laughs> in that kind of, kind of depressing, negative mindset. dark. Yeah. Yeah. So there, are, of, of course, for every bad uh, respiratory therapist, there are, thousands of wonderful ones yeah and i know that the respiratory therapists that i work with are amazing they're extremely intelligent i rely on them heavily at work because they understand the respiratory system so in depth you know we as nurses we have to understand all of the 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 body systems yeah but we understand them on a one level uh, yeah, like where, a fundamental level, like yes, an understanding, yes. Basic level. And then these people are trained and educated on that one system, and they understand it so well. So this is who you want to go to if you have any kind of problem with a ventilator or a BiPAP or breathing issues. They understand ABGs. They understand everything that has to do with the respiratory system. So, like, I've never dealt with someone with a, on a ventilator, but the BiPAP machines, the high flows, mm-hmm. all of these things, they can get very, very complicated. And I've always had a, a, a difficult time with all of the resp- respiratory, like, equipment and things. And these respiratory mm-hmm. therapists are really, like, lifesavers. They really, really are lifesavers, especially when someone is having a hard time breathing, when you don't know if they should be on a high flow, or you don't know if a BiPAP or a CPAP or if they should be on a non-rebreather. Like, these right. respiratory, they're going to help you. They're going to guide you through. And if you know anything about anything, you need to breathe, right? Like, respiratory, mm-hmm. like, that, like, that's key, right? Do, do they have an airway? Do they have an airway is, like, of the course, number one yeah. question. So. I, yeah. They're the A and B of the ABCs. Right? Right? So <laughs> these respiratory therapists are very, very important. Yes. And so this story that we're, of course, we always like to counter the bad one with something good. And so we're doing the story on a respiratory therapist, Cindy Keeley, who works at the American Heart Association in Charleston, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And so someone came in apparently while she was just doing her job and said that they needed her in a conference room. And apparently there was a, a woman who was there for a meeting, a volunteer meeting, and collapsed. And so she needed immediate atten- uh, attention. And when she, Keely got there, she... Obviously, it was it was apparent to her that she wasn't breathing. She didn't have a pulse, and she said she her only thought was I can't let her die. And I, I can imagine how horrifying this is. You're the the person everybody's kind of looking to. If you've ever been in a situation, I haven't, but um, where something is going on, some medical event, and you're kind of out in the community. I mean, I've been in a situation where something like this has happened. But I've never been in a situation where I had to be the one to step up because. You know, there's, it, I feel like there's usually somebody there who will yes. like jump in. Mm-hmm. And then, so if there's a doctor or somebody else that's willing to just like jump in there and do something, I'll kind of be there, wait, you know, kind of looking around like, do I need to do anything? <laughs> right. I yes. think they got this. I'm probably going to just, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I'll call 911. You guys do what you need right. to do. Right. <laughs> so she's probably, thinking this is me i don't have anybody else to to go to this is they're expecting me to do this 
Right. And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot and, of pressure. And, and on top of that, like, if you're in a situation like you're out and about and you see someone collapse, like, oh my goodness, like, I have to react now. But she was in a situation where she was w- working. The, yeah. The, the bad situation happened. And then everyone runs to her and says, you need to fix this problem. That's even, right. like, that's, that's a lot, lot of pressure. That's a, right. a lot of pressure. I know. So she, they got the, the AED. And, you know, and then immediately I'm thinking of the ACLS. <laughs> Those right. videos are so funny. Like, you, go get the AED. Yeah, hey. call now. <laughs> you know, how they do. <laughs> it, it looks like that's literally what happened. Um, exactly. The emergency responders got there within three to five minutes. That's fast. That's legit. That's some speed. Yeah. She regained consciousness. She began breathing, coughing. The When she hooked her up to the AED, it did tell her, you know, it, it, it analyzes their rhythm. And then it will tell you if you need to shock them or not. And it did tell her that she she needed a shock. And she shocked her. And gave her chest compressions and then within the three to five minutes then when the emergency responders got there she was breathing again and her heart had a pulse so it did exactly the what what it was supposed to do exactly exactly wonderful yes and it it, apparently it wasn't the first time that she had actually been (laughs) in a situation (laughs) like this which is crazy to me it is insane she was on I weekend never, duty. Like, I never, ever want to be in this situation. No, like, I, just I don't never, either. ever in my life want to be in this situation. Uh-uh. I, my husband knows where if we're ever out in the, in the community and something happens, you do not say, my wife is a nurse. My no. wife is a, She can do nope. it. <laughs> no. Right? Yeah. No, I, no, no. Don't put I don't that kind be, of pressure on me. I don't want to be that person. I will be ultra aware. Trust me. I'm going to be looking around to make sure somebody's doing something. And if no one else, <laughs> if nobody else is jumping on it, I'm going to be on it. And I'll be helping and assisting any way that I can. But I don't, I'm just not going to assume that I'm the best person for that. You know, maybe there's an emergency room nurse who's more um, equipped and used to dealing with emergent <laughs> Tina, situations. Tina, Tina. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're scared. funny, Tina. You're, you're a funny lady. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I'm at the <laughs> hospital and we, you know, we have, um, we have ambu bags and we have, we a have team. All, everything there. You know, we have a code cart. We have devices, medications, and all sorts of things to help us assist us with helping someone who's in distress. In that situation, I'm a hundred percent comfortable jumping in and doing whatever I need to do. And we, we're all doing that. But in the community, it's very different. That is not PCU. <laughs> and exactly. Yeah, it's no, a no, different. No. So I just don't ever want to assume that I am the best person for that situation. I, if there's like an emergency room person or, you know, a doctor who is is familiar, anybody, a paramedic would probably be the best person. So right. maybe someone else is there with a little more knowledge and I can help. Yeah. I'll assist. You know, I'll be the runner in this case. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but if, if needed, of course, I would jump in and do whatever I could possibly do to help. Um, but sh- this happened to her twice. This woman is just finding herself in these situations all the time, apparently. She was uh, doing weekend duty with the West Virginia National Guard. And yeah. one of her fellow soldiers collapsed and went into cardiac arrest. Is that not crazy? That is crazy. That is insane. Uh, yeah. So she saw that he was going to need CPR, began compressions, told someone else in the room to go, you, call, call, go call 911, (laughs) you, you know, get the AED. AED. She asked at that time if anybody else had CPR training and another soldier said that he had. So they, together they did CPR um, until EMS got there. So it's always good to have somebody, your especially with sharing the compressions because yeah i'm happy you brought that up tina because yeah. um the most impressive part yeah so obviously she's a superstar obviously both of yeah. these situations are super drastic the first one it only took three to five minutes and the patient came back to you know res- went back to rosk yes. but the second the second situation so tina did mention that two people were switching off at the cpr but it lasted for 15 minutes 
That's a long 15 time. 15 minutes is an insanely long time to be doing CPR. Yes, I is. mean, that is crazy long. And I don't know how you guys do it at the hospital, but we, when we have our codes at the hospital, there's literally like a line of like nurses that are just rotating through doing CPR. Um, mm-hmm. And if you asked me to do CPR over five minutes, and thank God they were switching back and forth, but anything over five minutes and I'm like tapping out. So I feel like this is probably, probably the most impressive part about this good story I know. is the fact that it lasted for 15 minutes. Because and, it, the pa- and the soldier was revived. I mean, that's the crazy was. thing. He's alive and well today. She said, due to quick action, high quality CPR and the AED. That's That was her actual words. Um, and it's interesting that you say that, Kate, because you're young and s- seem to be very <laughs> fit. So if you... Why, thank you. If you have a problem, I don't even want to think about me. I'm just like, oh, I can do two, and then somebody else needs to take over. Right, right. Can't handle it. It also says that the woman that was at the meeting is doing well. She is in good spirits. She's got her family with her. She knows how lucky she is. She's very thankful that she got the care that she did, and very thankful that you know that people jumped in, was able to give that CPR, and... um. Of course, it brought some good attention to the American Heart Association, to her newsletter. And she's Keely that, you know, she works for the American Heart Association. So she is that person that knows every single step and exactly how everything is supposed to go. Um, And she was just hoping that this this story gets out there and that it will help to illustrate how important it is to learn. CPR and t- and to teach other people, you know, Z Dog MD did a a video recently where he was talking about a story. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think it was somewhere in Asia, um, but a person collapsed, and they started doing compressions on him. They continued to, to do compressions. I want to say he was at the emergency room, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But all they were continuing to do rounds of, com- of of CPR compressions, and they just continued, continued, continued. And every time they would stop, he would start to code again. So they'd have to continue. They'd have to. They kept having to do this. At some point, they were able to determine that he had an aortic dissection, and there was literally no possible way they were going to save this man's life. It was impossible. They couldn't That's repair. Insane. Yeah. All, you can't so repair they, a dissection while doing CPR. Like you have to decide, like, yeah. am I going to stop and cut this man open or am I going to yeah. continue and he, CPR? And you can't cut him open die. fast enough. Exactly. So while they were doing the compressions, he would wake up and talk. And then when they would stop, he would then code because they were pumping his blood for him. So that, that is, is insane. His yeah, and his point was that really good quality compressions, really good quality CPR truly does save lives, but they had to let that man die because and they basically at, at one point had to just decide. He's awake and alert and oriented and knows exactly what's going on and he knows that they have they have no choice but to stop doing the compressions and that he's oh going to die when they do. Is that not terrible? So that is terrible. And like, it's yeah. crazy to say, like, this is the craziest thing that I'm going to say probably. But like, <laughs> the fact that he was alive while they were doing compressions on him <clears throat> is is crazy because it's very painful. It mm-hmm. is very painful for someone yeah. to be put, putting that much pressure on your chest, right? When you're unconscious and your heart stops beating, of course it's necessary. But every time I've done, comp- every time I've been in a situation where we're doing compressions on someone, and when they come to, they mm-hmm. freak out because yeah. it's painful. Well, it is yes. very painful. Yes, it's it crazy. is. Yeah, there's a video that goes around. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I shouldn't laugh about this. But there is a video that goes around. There's some guys that are doing compressions. <laughs> the guy's awake. And they're continuing to do compressions. <laughs> he's just like, ow. <laughs> Have you seen this video? It's terrible. I think he's I like, have. ow. He's like, <laughs> But they're like, no, continue compressions. <laughs> no, 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 no. Do 
<laughs> oh. to change your compressions, boo boo. <laughs> oh, so terrible. That's but wild. oh, I told you guys, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I'm like that. I can't help it. I always laugh at everything. That's oh, wild. so it's terrible. Anyway, this was a wonderful respiratory therapist who knew knows exactly um, how to perform CPR, knows exactly what to do to bring back somebody to life who has gone into cardiac arrest or who yeah. doesn't have a pulse, who's not breathing. That's what it's all about. Exactly. It really is. So we are very thankful for our respiratory therapists. And I just, I, w- I want them to all know. I think sometimes, I don't know if you experience this or not. Sometimes there's a little bit of, maybe a little bit of contention between the nurses and the respiratory therapist. I don't know how it is, uh, how, what your experience has been. But it can happen that way because I think there is, because they do know everything about the respiratory system. They're, sometimes the, the RTs are kind of like, why do you not know this? You know, they they get yeah. frustrated with, with nurses for not knowing all of that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, <laughs> for us, it's not so much that, maybe because you're in the, the PCU, mm-hmm. um, we only have a section of our unit that is PCU, the whole unit isn't, and the the tension between the respiratory therapist and the nurses are, we have to call a respiratory therapist to our unit. Oh. So when, as a nurse, when I'm freaking out because the high flow isn't high enough, so I'm, we're allowed to titrate high flow, but if mm-hmm. a patient's on BiPAP and uh, they're desatting, right, that, that, that's something where us nurses start to freak out because we're like, we need someone to be here right now yes. because they're on the BiPAP and it's not functioning. So if we don't have a respiratory therapist on the unit, on the floor, and we're waiting, mm-hmm. it is like, it's just like, we're like, we need a patient to breathe. Like, where are yeah. you? Please come here right now. And yeah, then they you come feel up powerless. And then, exactly. And then they'll do a quick few buttons, change the settings. Yeah. They'll be back to business, right? So, right. yeah, that's the only tension we get. What I tend to do when that happens, you know, uh, what I've learned over the years is in those situations, whenever the the rest are there, especially if it's one that I'm real comfortable with, I'll be like, show me what you just did. (laughs) And I just learn a little bit at a time, you know, um, okay, next time I'll know that's how you go up on the FIO2 percentage. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) And then the next time that happens, I will... You know, they'll, they'll, I'll page them. They'll get there and they're like, why are they on 100% FIOT? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, don't, oh, worry, don't worry. Don't <laughs> worry. Sorry. <laughs> He's alive, isn't he? <laughs> and they're like, oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but some of these, I, I, I know, I know, but some of these respiratory therapists like uh, live in the wild, wild west. They're like, oh, yeah. they could hang out at 86. I'm like, no, 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 boo boo. I know. <laughs> no, let's, let's, let's bump this up just a little bit more. <laughs> like, they don't <laughs> get like, rattled about anything. Like, nothing really is an emergency. They are just cool, calm, and collected all the time. Oh, oh, oh. <sighs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, Q, we made it through another episode of yes. Good Nurse, Bad Nurse and picked on the respiratory therapist this week. And that's that's good. Who knows what yeah. we'll do next time? <laughs> right. Probably another doctor. I'm going to go, <laughs> go out on a limb there and say it's, it's probably going to be a doctor. doctor. I'm just Chances saying because, are. yeah, when I was looking at this story, I found uh, several of them. And I was just so tempted and I was like, I'm not going to do it this time. So, yeah, it it'll probably be another doctor. <laughs> So I just want to remind everybody, Q, remind everybody where they can find you when you're not oh. on Good Nurse, Bad Nurse. Yeah, so you can find me at Q the Nurse. It's literally just the letter Q and then the nurse. And you can find me on Instagram and on YouTube. And that's where you can find most of my stuff. Oh, as if you're listening to this on a podcast, wherever you listen to your podcast, Google, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, also find me there at Q the Nurse. Awesome. And go look him up. And you guys go look us up too. We're on Facebook at GMBN Podcast and Instagram at Good Nurse Bad Nurse Podcast, I think. Look us up and follow us or go to our website at www.goodnursebadnurse.com. And we would love to have you following us. And we also want to remind everyone that even if you're a bad girl or a bad boy, right? Be a good nurse. <laughs> right. 